This Saturday, Australia's best young performers compete in this week's heat of Quest. Be entertained by some of our most talented rising stars. An outstanding lineup with Australia's musical future. 7.30 Saturday on Quest. At 7.30, a state divided. Football will, will not be the same in uh, this state again. History at home, but who will triumph? <laughs> Split Allegiance, tonight, 7.30. Tonight, following the 7.30 report, it's waiting for God. That's what he wants. A beauty queen. <laughs> a beauty queen? <laughs> oh, my God. My hobbies are travel and world peace. Dr. Finley farewells a friend. I take it you won't be seeing me off then? Uh, afraid not. Things to do. Busy day. Anyway, I'm not very good at send-offs. <laughs> As I remember, you weren't exactly the world's greatest welcoming committee either. <laughs> the world at war. Berlin ordered. The Führer has decided to raise the city of Petersburg from the face of the earth. Then H.G. and Roy, followed by Alexei Sayer. I went to Australia once, for three minutes. I got to the immigration desk at Sydney, and the bloke was filling out the form there, and he said, there, height, eyes, trousers. He said, criminal record. I said, I didn't know you still needed one. <laughs> And don't miss Roy and HG live tonight. Tonight, budget bonus, interest rates on the way down. Labour MPs chastised over a tax on the DPP. And Australia's wool growers may reap an unexpected windfall from the wool stockpile. Also tonight, nurses offered a 10% pay rise and farmers welcomed the opening rains. Good evening, Peter Holland with ABC News. Home loan interest rates are on the way down, giving an enormous boost to the Keating government's budget selling campaign. Four banks this afternoon announced cuts, three of them on fixed term rates. The most important was Westpac's move to reduce its premium variable rate by 0.35 of 1%. The Prime Minister says the budget has set the political pendulum swinging back to Labour. It was all bread and circuses on the budget campaign trail today. There's a little demonstration of what our Prime Minister has to go through in Cabinet. Friends old and new turned up to the traditional Collingwood Football Club post-budget lunch for the entertainment, particularly the free tips provided by the Prime Minister. We were long odds but we're shortening. A bit like Collingwood, long odds but shortening. Get on to us now and uh, get a tip right from the horse's mouth. Confidence based on his view of John Howard's budget reply last night. Poor little John, he was in there last night doing his best, <laughs> gesticulating and carrying on with our very glum little side behind him. And that kind of uh, cheap name calling, people are getting very tired of it, but he of course uh, is the high priest of it. The opposition leader's budget attack continued to focus on Mr Keating's broken promises, warning voters it could all be repeated on superannuation. They could easily end up with them paying the 3% and not getting a wage rise, but the Prime Minister, if he's re-elected, reneging on what he said he contributed to the savings bill. I mean, he's done it before. All the thrust and parry of an election campaign. But so far, the luck is going Paul Keating's way. Yesterday, news of 90,000 new jobs and a four-year low in the unemployment rate. Today, four banks have cut their housing loan interest rates. The National Australia Bank, the ANZ and St George announced reductions averaging half a percent on a range of fixed-term loans, but were a short time ago upstaged by Westpac, which trimmed its variable rate by 0.35 of a percent to 10.4%. This is confirming a good trend and I think it'll come as welcome news to homeowners that some of the financial institutions are now starting to begin to drop their rates after having seen the budget. It's also a dream end to the government's budget week. 
Labour Party backbencher Mark Neville has been disciplined for recent attacks on the Director of Public Prosecutions, John McKechnie. Opposition leader Jim McGinty says Mr Neville had no right to drag Mr McKechnie's family into the public spotlight. It's been revealed that Mr McKechnie's teenage son was cautioned by police over events surrounding a burglary at a neighbour's home. Jim McGinty says it's unacceptable to target the children of people in public office. I've spoken to Mark Neville in strong terms and I've told him that that is not part of the Labor Party's agenda and I won't tolerate it. But Mark Neville says if he's been disciplined, it's news to him. He says he never at any stage referred to Mr McKechnie's children and all he's agreed to is to refer any complaints involving family members of John McKechnie to the state ombudsman. And the campaign against the DPP showed no signs of slowing today, with Federal Labor MP Graham Campbell hitting out. We're not attacking McKechnie through his children. In my view, he's hiding behind his children. Now, it makes me sick to the back teeth, all this sanctimonious nonsense. His children are privileged children. Graham Campbell is a law unto himself, and I take no responsibility for what he says or does. But the Labor Party does have responsibility, and it's understood there are already moves from within the ALP to punish Mr Campbell. The police union, which Mr McKechnie has accused of being part of a campaign to undermine his office, suggests a board be established to oversee the DP's operations and keep him accountable. That someone, or a committee, should overview his actions to ensure that he's doing it properly. But the suggestion has received a cold response on both sides of the political fence. I think the independence of the Director of Public Prosecutions is paramount and I would not want to see that compromised. Attorney General Cheryl Edwards says the DPP has developed prosecuting guidelines which are public information and, as such, the office is totally accountable. Mrs Edwards says she regards the attacks against Mr McKechnie as an attack on the independence of that office. Aborigines who passed through the remote Banjuan station where sarin gas was tested last year say they saw big planes arriving and Japanese wearing protective clothing. They're surprised that the police haven't contacted them about what they saw on the station, which was formerly owned by the Japanese sect accused of the Tokyo subway gas attack. Federal police say any traces of sarin have been neutralised and no one is at risk. Police were tight-lipped about the progress of the investigation into the testing of sarin gas at the station, 700 kilometres northeast of Perth. Yesterday, police displayed the laboratory where it said members of the OM Supreme Truth sect tested the deadly gas on sheep before the Tokyo subway attack earlier this year. We have uh, uh, officers up there. Um, the, the inquiry is continuing up there. Meanwhile, members of the Mulga Queen Aboriginal community say they saw planes arriving last year when they passed through the station and saw Japanese kitted out in protective clothing. Some people in the community that have been there, they said that had like big rubber boots and big gloves on, like an overalls outfit, you know, lab, you know, some people said it looked like a protective clothes, you know. Vanessa Thomas said that in August or September last year, she saw two big planes land at the airstrip and many Japanese in traditional clothing walking to the property. On another occasion, her mother, Phyllis, saw a single plane. They were wearing protective clothes. When they got off? Yeah, they were marching. You know, when you wave, they don't want to even look at you to wave or anything. You know, it looked like they were just come at a concentration camp. MP for Air Julian Grill told the 7.30 report that while he now believed the community was not in danger, police should have checked on them once it was known chemicals had been tested at Banjuan. It's very isolated. Um, there's no police protection. There's no surveillance in that uh, part of Australia. They're a long way away from civilisation. They are vulnerable. We haven't been contacted by the police. We're not aware of anything that's going on. State police say they're unaware of any Aborigines having possibly been at risk. That's the first I've heard of it. And uh, my regional officer, Cal Gurley, certainly hasn't uh, passed any information on to me and he certainly would if, uh, if that occurred. A federal police spokesman said sarin quickly dispersed in the environment, the testing had been confined to a very limited area, any residues had been got rid of and it was unlikely anyone could have been harmed. The state government has offered WA nurses a 10% pay increase. The offer is linked to penalty trade-offs and an end to accrued days off in lieu of overtime. The offer has received a negative response from the Australian Nursing Federation, which is still pressing ahead for a flat 8% increase through federal awards. It's International Nurses Day, 
an appropriate time for Health Minister Graham Kirith to unveil a new pay offer for the 15,000 public hospital nurses. Mr Kirith says it involves a 10% pay rise in return for a shorter working week. It's a, I believe, a very attractive package. It will take nurses from being one of the worst paid in the country to at least the second highest paid nurses in the whole of Australia. But there's been a blunt response from a sceptical union. Certainly the reaction to date, and of course it's only been out for a very short period, has been tell them where to stick it. Ms Attrell says the trade-offs linked to the increase are unsatisfactory, such as introducing a 38-hour week, which would prevent nurses from accruing days off under the current 48-hour week. There's also concern about abolishing penalties for afternoon shifts. So that in fact where a nurse used to receive uh, full eight hours with penalties, they'll only receive two now. But if you work at normal hours during the day like everybody else, then you don't get paid penalties for that. Now I reckon that that's common sense and reasonable and most people would view it in that light. Mr Kirith says he's prepared to negotiate the offer with unions who are set to take it to their members in the next few weeks. The treaty that's helped keep the world safe from nuclear weapons for the past 25 years is to continue. After nearly a month of debate, 175 countries, including Australia, have agreed to extend the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty indefinitely. News of the decision was relayed to US President Clinton in Ukraine, which has just finished scrapping the nuclear arsenal it inherited from the Soviet Union. Arriving in Kiev from a nearly disastrous summit with Boris Yeltsin in Moscow, Bill Clinton had more to look forward to here in the Ukraine, a summit with no arguments whatsoever. Greeting him at Kiev's Marinsky Palace was Leonid Kuchma, Ukraine's second president since it became independent in 1991. He's tried hard to cultivate good relations with America and is receiving aid galore in return. Having agreed to give up its nuclear weapons, Ukraine is America's favorite among former Soviet republics. Washington has given 50 million pounds to turn the biggest nuclear missile factory in the world, ironically once managed by President Kuchma, into a factory that produces saucepans. The United States has built a very strong relationship with Ukraine. And last year we had a very good year as Ukraine became a non-nuclear state. And I believe its strategic importance is very, very great. And so I, I put a very high priority on the relationship between the United States and Ukraine. The only controversial aspect of Mr. Clinton's trip concerned this bust of America's first couple. When cast in bronze, it was deemed to exceed the value of gifts allowed to be received by a U.S. president, so Hillary had to be amputated from it. India is putting more troops into Kashmir following the torching of a holy Muslim shrine. The 650-year-old temple was burnt down during clashes between Indian soldiers and Muslim militants. The incident could lead to increased tension between India and Pakistan. The smoke marks the site where one of Kashmir's patron saints has been revered for 600 years. The army and militants in the shrine blame each other for starting the fire. There was little that fire engines could do as a gun battle continued all day. Militants, seen here earlier in the two months long siege, identified themselves by their initials as Hizbul Mujahideen. They're backed in their fight to split Kashmir from India by Pakistan, whose Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto has called the burning of the shrine wanton and willful sacrilege. But speaking in remarkably strong terms, an Indian government minister responds that there is unfinished business between the two countries who fought two wars over Kashmir. I must certainly warn Pakistan here today, enough is enough. Don't test the patience of this great nation. Whoever burnt down the shrine, the violent end to the siege coming on the Islamic holy day of Eid will strengthen the hand of the militants and make it impossible to hold elections which had been promised by the government in Kashmir next month. Back home, a dispute at Mount Isa Mines, which is costing the nation $3 million a day, looks set to be prolonged. Today, the mines management locked workers out of Australia's biggest lead and zinc mine. The unions retaliated. Workers walked off the job in four MIM coal mines in Queensland and threatened to extend the strike to coal mines in other states. After 12 weeks of industrial action and growing tensions over the wages dispute, this morning's lockout was something of a non-event. 
Management posted notices saying the gates would shut to all workers and security guards blocked every entrance to the mine site. Australia's largest zinc and copper mine ground to a complete halt at 10 this morning. Workers who'd been stood down since Monday deliberately stayed away from the mine site so they could maintain a picket line at the nearby power station which supplies electricity to the mine. What can we possibly do out there that uh, would in any way improve our position? I, I just do not see the sense in us uh, going and, uh, and acting like uh, naughty boys and saying, well, let us in, let us in. At the power station picket line, morale was boosted as news filtered through of support from other unions. Yeah, it's great. It's uh, a lot of solidarity. Much appreciated. Thousands of workers at four of MIM's Queensland coal mining operations walked off the job in support. If Mount Isa Mines decides to up the ante again and take uh, any form of legal action against people bona fide involved in industrial disputation, then a decision has been taken by my organisation to shut the coal mining industry down nationally. Coal workers around Australia will vote in the next 48 hours on nationwide strike action. Fighting funds are already in place and unions are calling on banks for a moratorium on home loan repayments until the dispute ends. Care Australia says its international reputation remains intact despite a report to federal parliament showing it overstated past budgets. The money has since been repaid and Care now claims to have new management systems and procedures in place. Care's national director, Ian Harris, is absent with a serious illness. But Chairman Malcolm Fraser said no single person would be held accountable for past errors in administration. And um, I believe that there were deficiencies during a rapid period of growth. We're not trying to, I mean, collectively we accept responsibility, uh, but it doesn't advance anything at all to try and say that uh, one particular person or persons were responsible. The board welcomed a separate finding that 95% of funds received by CARE go directly to aid programs. The Adelaide pensioner who shot dead an intruder last week will not be charged. The South Australian Director of Public Prosecutions says there is no reasonable prospect of a conviction against the 84-year-old. But the DPP warned that his decision was not an endorsement of the use of firearms for self-defence. The fatal shooting of 32-year-old Ian Aspinall in the early hours of Wednesday last week renewed a fierce debate over the right of self-defence. Police decided not to lay any immediate charges against Mr Geisler, preferring to refer the matter to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, he will not be charged with any criminal offence in relation to the shooting. There was no reasonable prospect of conviction on either of the charges of murder or manslaughter. Aspinall's body was found at the foot of Albert Geisler's bed. He was killed by a single gunshot. Police investigations confirmed there was a forced entry and Aspinall was accompanied by at least one other person. They also say he had a significant level of alcohol in his blood. Mr Rofe says Albert Geisler's age was a significant factor and he warned his decision not to prosecute should not be seen as an endorsement to resort to firearms for self-defence. As I said, the decision not to prosecute is peculiar to this case. There are no guarantees that in a, in a different situation uh, with different pe people involved um, that uh, there won't be a prosecution. The decision not to prosecute has been welcomed in many quarters. But it should not have been any different. I mean, inside your house, you're entitled to protect yourself and your family. You are not entitled to be invaded. Unfortunate part about it all is that the fact he's had to wait so long for the decision. Mr Geisler is reportedly relieved about the outcome. Australia's wool growers are set to reap a billion dollar windfall from the wool stockpile which had been seen as a disaster. The stockpile of millions of bales and the massive debt which went with it are expected to be cleared in three years and growers are likely to get back triple the price they paid to buy up the unwanted wool. It was a bizarre economical experiment that has miraculously paid off. When world supply of wool outstripped demand in 1989, Australian wool growers refused to drop their price. Instead, they bought their own wool at huge prices. The stockpile peaked in 1991 with nearly 5 million bales of wool and a debt of $2.7 billion. But today, wool growers were smiling. We have a stable market and good prospects for the future, and we are now looking at eliminating the debt component of the wool tax. 
The fixed selling of the stockpile and strong wool prices, a result of the drought, has meant a complete turnaround in fortunes for wool growers. The money they contributed has tripled and they could get back $1.1 billion. The Board of Wool International, the body set up to manage the stockpile, has recommended 80% of funds go back to growers when the debt is paid off in 1998. The remaining 20% could be used to privatise Wool International. We can see some really good options which are uh, adding value to the, the wool growers' asset but also giving greater effectiveness and efficiency to the, uh, to the industry. That will be for wool growers to decide. For the government, the decision now is when to eliminate the wool tax that pays for the stockpile. Farmers in parts of Western Australia's wheat belt have been busy planting crops after the first rains of the season. Good opening rains were recorded in several centres, but not in the Great Southern, where a combination of gale force winds and no rain led to dust storms. Ian Hall and his family were having a busy day today, planting crops after the first rain for the season. Oh, the, ra the rain basically means it's a good early start, and if things keep going, well, the year's going to be a much better year than last year. His property received about 26 millimetres, or an inch on the old scale. Other centres also recorded significant falls. We've got reasonable falls certainly over the western parts of the wheat belt, and that's a bit of a temptation, I guess, of things to come. Farmers say the rain provides a handy start to the season, but they say they'll need plenty more wet weather to ensure a bumper harvest. If we could pull in a yearly average of 12 or 13 inches spread over the year, you'd say, oh, that's a nice solid year, an appreciable year. It's been a completely different story for parts of the Great Southern. Centres including Arthur River, Kitanning, Broom Hill and Jerramungup having to contend with dust storms. There's a bit of a rain shadow there, a lack of rain again this time around the Kitanning district. And uh, of course you get Garforce westerlies, you don't get rain with it, you start to lose your topsoil and that's what's happened. The long-term outlook for those areas isn't so bright either, with forecasters right, predicting a drier than average yeah. season. The state government's new Fine Enforcement Act appears to be failing. Police say that since the legislation came into effect in April, nearly 5,000 driver's licences have been suspended. Under the new act, people not paying fines lose their driver's licence until the fines are paid. So far, 4,882 people have had their driver's licences suspended, while less than 400 have paid. People in some instances may genuinely uh, not know. But, I mean, people must know that they owe money in fines and that, and, and there's a likelihood of losing their licence. Police believe many fine defaulters are still driving while under suspension. If caught, they face a further nine months licence cancellation. Police Commissioner Bob Falconer and the Justice Ministry are looking at a number of options for changes. Out of finance, and although buyers were back in the share market today, they weren't too excited. The All Ordinaries was down, with News Corporation shares falling 17 cents after the announcement of a deal with the US-based MCI. Offshore, continuing strength in the yen, limited gains by the Japanese share market, but Hong Kong surged again. The Australian dollar rallied in late trading, erasing most of the week's losses. Now with today's sports news, here's Trevor Jenkins. Thank you, Peter, and good evening. A grand final-like atmosphere has gripped Perth as the city prepares for Sunday's historic AFL match between the West Coast Eagles and the Fremantle Dockers. The atmosphere surrounding the inaugural clash intensified today with the unveiling of a new trophy to mark the occasion. The Western Derby trophy may become a new holy grail for the two Perth AFL teams, but the people of Perth are having trouble deciding who'll win it. Eagles. No, <laughs> Dockers. Dockers, Mighty Eagles. Well, I mean, being in the middle of Fremantle, it must be the Dockers, of course. Well, the Bureau's really tipping the Eagles here. And we're usually right, you know. The, the Bureau's usually about 90% accurate. Dockers coach Gerard Neesham says the new rivalry is a godsend for Fremantle supporters. If you came to an Eagles game and you're West Australian, you're expected to barrack for the Eagles. And I think the good part about what's happening now is that, that we do have our parochialism coming back in. The build-up to Sunday hasn't affected the cool professionalism of Mick Malthouse. It's like some bloke working in a, in a, in a mine. He goes down there at 8 o'clock, he, he comes back at 12 o'clock, has his lunch, goes back down again. <laughs> I mean, what's to enjoy about that? The match will be decided in front of 45,000, including Prime Minister Paul Keating. He's back the Eagles, joining those willing to invest in the match. Uh, the betting's really restricted to the Eagles. Uh, the punters are rallying to the Eagles. And 
not too much interest in the Dockers at this time. Mr Keating will open the new stand on Subiaco Oval's southern wing. A wonderful weekend coming up. Rugby Super League is starting to take shape. News Limited has named nine teams for the competition with a kick-off next year. And hopes of a compromise were raised with news bosses and ARL officials holding talks in Sydney today. Today was a red-letter day for Super League boss John Rebo. News Limited confirmed Sydney's Bulldogs and Sharks, the Penrith Panthers, Auckland Warriors, Brisbane, Canberra, the North Queensland Cowboys and the Western Reds as the eight current ARL Premiership clubs to take up Super League franchises. We do have a competition now and uh, I also uh, believe that over the next few weeks we'll, we'll, be able, we'll be in a position where we can nominate the next club. Ninth licence in the 10-team competition goes to the City of Newcastle, with the West's licence club securing the franchise and hoping for a joint venture with the Knights. The 10th spot is literally up for grabs, but most likely to be based in Sydney's North, though both Norths and Manly are backing the ARL. Melbourne and Adelaide will be offered berths in Super League second year. Amongst the Super League clubs, North Queensland Cowboys believe they have the best deal. We demanded and we got again extra financial assistance. Uh, I might uh, comment here over and above what was given to other clubs. We are unique, unique in the league in North Queensland and they have recognised it and compensated us quite generously. And serious talk today of reconciliation with league chairman Ken Arthurson holding private talks with News Limited uh, chief uh, Ken Cowley. John Rebo says Super League needs the ARL, particularly in areas concerned with the game's development. We, we always want to do this in conjunction with the ARL, and uh, no one was going to be a loser. Everyone was going to be a shareholder in this, for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. The ARL refused to comment on today's meeting. John Rebo simply said the talks had been positive. Still with Rugby League, the Western Reds appear to be heading for defeat in their match against Western Suburbs in Sydney. Midway through the second half, Wests lead the Reds by 20 points. It's. Team New Zealand is just one win away from the America's Cup. Black Magic has gone to a 4-0 lead in the finals, beating Dennis Connor's Stars and Stripes team in their latest encounter by 3 minutes and 37 seconds. In a borrowed boat, Young America, Dennis Connor has been competitive at the start line and for the first time in the final series, beyond, actually leading for 20 minutes, the first two times the boats crossed. You're going to be ahead. However, the New Zealanders' gamble to sail the other side of the course paid off. Left hand side. Nice shift if this is real. Right now, we're, all, we're actually pressured and we're just going like this on them on bearing, you know? The next time the boats met, Black Magic was 10 lengths in front, leading by 1 minute and 9 seconds at the first mark, and on their way to another commanding victory. And Team New Zealand in the familiar position. The winning margin, 3 minutes and 37 seconds. The Kiwis now poised to become the second country, after Australia in 1983, to wrest the America's Cup from the United States. Team New Zealand are now just one win away from winning the greatest prize in sailing. Team Stars and Stripes beaten to the point of exasperation. I'm not to the point of crying, but I mean, I've never been in a race where I really felt I had so little control over the outcome. It's obviously a very, very fast boat and, and uh, you know, it's uh, looking good for us. Subdued congratulations today are likely to become unbridled celebrations after race five, Sunday morning our time. Have a good weekend. Here's Sarah Knight now with the weather. Thanks, Trevor. More showers today for the south, but not making it to the great southern and eastern south coast where it's really needed. A few for Perth, though. The mercury climbed to 20 degrees exactly at 10 past midday after an overnight low of 14.8 at 5 to 6 this morning. Right now at 16 degrees, the relative humidity 70%. The winds westerly at 12 kilometres per hour and the barometric pressure rising. A very similar day to yesterday in the north. The highest maximum 36 degrees at Curtin and Derby, with the highest minimum at Currie Bay and Christmas Island 25 degrees. A cold day in southern parts, the lowest maximum 14 degrees at Dwelling Up, the lowest minimum not that cold, 11 degrees at several centres, including Lake Grace, Menzies, Manjum Up and Narragin. That's because of the high winds. For the rainfall to the 30 hours to 3 pm today, the heavy falls in the far southwest mostly recorded yesterday. Today, most falls reported along the south coast, but not penetrating inland or further east of Metla. Showers in the Gascoigne, very isolated. A good fall at Three Rivers, though, 16 millimetres.
to the satellite photograph taken at 2 o'clock this afternoon and you can see the middle level cloud band where the isolated showers in the Gascoigne occurred. The low is now well in the bite and there's a front trailing along the south coast and it's that front that brought showers to the western south coast today and with the westerly airstream coming around that low we've had showers in the lower and central western parts today. If we have a look at the surface chart at 12 noon on the south coast, the, that westerly airstream, and it's because of this westerly wind direction that the great southern and eastern south coasts are missing out on the rain. Winds are still strong along the lower west and south coasts, and there's a strong wind and gale warning for coastal waters from Durian Bay right round to Eucla for tonight. By tomorrow morning, winds should moderate on the lower west coast but remain strong along the south coast. The winds will turn more southwesterly, so expect scattered showers on the south coast and isolated showers to penetrate inland. In western and northern parts of the southwest land division, showers expected to become isolated and clear inland later on. So the official state forecast for the lower southwest and southern coastal parts, scattered showers, possible hail on the south coast, winds gradually moder moderating. For the remainder of the southwest land division, goldfields, Gascoigne interior and southwest Pilbara, areas of cloud with isolated showers. Another warm, fine day for most centres in the north tomorrow and for the south, temperatures remaining low. The southwest Land Division outlook for Sunday, as the high moves in, expect isolated south coastal drizzle and with an easterly pattern re-establishing fine weather for the rest. On Monday, the winds turn northeasterly and temperatures should gradually start to rise one degree or two for most centres. Around the nation, a few showers for Adelaide, rain for Melbourne and Hobart, and a late shower for Sydney. And for Perth, some further showers overnight, decreasing to a shower or two tomorrow. Fresh to gusty southwesterly winds moderating overnight, a maximum of 19. The outlook for the city, the weather clearing by Sunday, with fine weather expected to continue. Have a good weekend, Peter. Thank you, Sarah. That's all for the moment. I'll be back in an hour with an update. Here's Alan Carpenter now on the 7.30 report. Thanks, Peter.